Lord, open our eyes and our ears that we may see and hear what you would have us learn about living as a child of yours. Amen. It's Fourth of July weekend. And it got me thinking about my own family, how we came to America in search of that word, that word called freedom. What would it mean to, to leave everything behind and come to a place hoping that something would be different? So I guess you could say, really, the history of America is the story of my family. Because just 10 years after the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth, one of my relatives arrived and finally settled in Mystic, Connecticut. And just a couple years after that, another one of my family members left Holland and came to New Amsterdam in New York. We know it better now as Brooklyn. When he was there, he became the ferryman and then sold the ferry and moved over to New Jersey. Another one of my relatives essentially was Shanghai. They went for a cruise on an afternoon with a girlfriend of theirs. They were promised it was just a short concert. When they left London, their next stop was somewhere along the Virginia coast where letters of indenture were waiting for them. And instead of being free, they had 10 years of servitude. Or other people in my family who were wealthier, who left England having a land grant from William Penn that they had purchased. It didn't matter how they got here. They all came for one thing, freedom, a chance at a better life than they had where they were. And according to Webster, being free is the first definition of freedom. But being independent, well, that's the second definition of freedom. And this weekend, as this is being recorded for airing, we celebrate, we celebrate our independence on Independence Day. And it got me looking at this document called the Declaration of Independence. And it starts out, the United Declaration of the 13 lowercase u, States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, we're going to leave Great Britain. We believe that we have a right to do this under God's will. But more importantly, we're going to tell you, King George, exactly why we are leaving. And then comes those very famous words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it goes on. And in the middle of this document is a very lengthy list of grievances those colonists had against King George. And they were pretty 
much like we don't want to pay those taxes and we want to rule ourselves. We believe, as it says at the end, that we are free and independent states and we deserve the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and thoughts which independent states might do. And we may assume that it was these words that spurred George Washington and his armies in the field, spurred on those patriots in Boston Harbor. But many of things, things had already happened. The tea had already been spilled. George Washington had already taken command of the Continental Army, as it was, and had actually gotten the British to give up Boston Harbor. And as this was being passed in Philadelphia, George Washington and his troops were preparing to defend New York. Among those troops that were depending, defending New York were some of those relatives I talked about. They had started two years before the Declaration of Independence. What would happen if the British came to our area and they had plans for how to protect it? It didn't work out very well because the British pretty much swept through that part in a fairly substantial, very short battle. But the troops moved on. It wasn't the end of the American dream. It was just a small bump in the road. And with them went those troops that had been planning in New Jersey because it turned out that they were blacksmiths. And when you're traveling with an army and you rely upon horses and wagons, a lot can go wrong that requires a blacksmith. And this family dedicated themselves to sleeping during the day while the army moved. And at night, they would fire up their fires and repair wagon wheels and shoe horses. So that in the morning when General Washington said, move out, the army could. There was no delay. And other members of our family served at Valley Forge and fought at the Battle of Charleston, were actually taken prisoner and loaded on prisoner of war ships that the British had. And at the end of the war, those people who were on those prisoner of war ships, well, the British needed those ships. See, their forces were under siege at Yorktown. And so that family member was dumped on the James Peninsula right before Yorktown fell. And after that, our family, they returned to whatever they did. Some of them were ministers. Some of them were business people. Most of them were farmers. My mom's family settled on the Eastern Shore, but they had been loyalists. And during this whole revolutionary time period, they supported the British. And they were among the third of American citizens at the time that did that. But there was another third of the citizens who said, eh, count me out, let me know how it ends. And then, as the dust settled and we proved that we could govern ourselves, that we wouldn't run rampant through the streets and have anarchy, we developed a document that still lives today called the Constitution of the United States. And it starts out with, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, 
do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. We were free. We didn't have anybody to rule us but ourselves. It is, as Jesus said in John, if you continue in my word and you are truly my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In the end of our reading today, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. But what kind of freedom did Jesus mean? If we know the truth, if the Son sets us free, what, what kind of freedom is that? The people he was addressing said, but we've never been slaves. And that was true. They had never physically been slaves, but they were slaves to sin. I think Paul explains it best in our Galatians reading today. It starts out with, for you were called to freedom, not to be slaves to anyone else or servants to anyone else, but to be free. Brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom for self-indulgence. In other words, because you are free, don't put others down. Don't bind them up. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Jewish tradition holds that commandment in a little different way. It says, don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. So I think that makes better sense when you read the end of Paul's passage right there. Take care that you don't consume one another with bits and bites. And then Paul gets into the heart of the matter. There are two worlds at war, just as the Americans and the British had fought one another. Now there are two different kinds of things that control our lives. The works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. And while I am loath to repeat reading the entire list, it says, if you choose the life of works of the flesh. There's a long list of things, and, and some of those words today we have a little misunderstanding about. So I'll repeat it from the message. It says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. In other words, I am right and you are wrong. So what happens? Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex? A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, in other words, those things like jewelry or fashion or cars. Magic show religion. That religion that looks good on the surface, but really has no depth to it. Paranoid loneliness. If you've watched YouTube lately, you've seen some of the biggest people on YouTube quitting. They have millions of followers. They get millions of views of any video they post, and yet, they all say they're lonely. They don't have that connection with anyone that builds them up, that makes them feel loved. Cutthroat competition. Don't we see that in business sometimes? Or 
in sports, people cheat a little, nah, don't play by the rules. All consuming yet never satisfied wants. Need I say more than Amazon? People who are only looking out for themselves can have a brutal temper. They can develop an impotence to love or be loved. You know, David's bridal went out of business again because nobody's getting married. Not enough people are getting married to keep them in business. Divided homes and divided lives over all kinds of things. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. A vicious habit of depersonalize everyone to be a rival. Rage, selfish ambition, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. In other words, all those things that the world kind of glorifies. But there's a warning. It says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So while those things are kind of cool and feel good temporarily, they are not the things of which the kingdom of God is built. So it says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. It's not against the law to feel joy or to show kindness. Now, for a little bit of time, it was against the law to be faithful in this country as COVID took its hold and we couldn't meet in our church sanctuaries. And yet this, this online service was provided almost instantly. And we continue to be faithful, just in a little different way. And we find that when we truly live as Christ wants us to live, it is very simple to choose which hand we should be living from, the fruits of the Spirit. And we find that we no longer desire any of those things from the flesh. It takes a while and we're constantly challenged. I'm not going to say that it's easy every day to just go kind of say, oh, I'm so happy. No. Nah. But if we live by the Spirit, if we let the Spirit live in us and guide our lives, we do live out these fruits easily and generously. So today, let us not be like the American patriots and the British supporters were, even until the 1850s. But now let us say, we are united. We are United States of America and we are united as Christians. Amen. Welcome to the Love Feast for Timonium United Methodist Church. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the last day that Jesus was with his disciples, he wanted them to remember him and to remember the sacrifice that he was making. And so he took the bread that was at the table and he broke it and he gave it to them, asking them to take, eat, and be thankful for all that he had done for them and to keep him alive in their hearts. And after the supper, Jesus took the cup that was at the table and he told them that this was now to represent his blood, the blood that would establish a new relationship between God and people. And that in taking of this cup, we strengthen our connection to the Lord Jesus Christ and to all those who call him Lord. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, Honor and glory, glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.